to the mo uh, from directions that were most vulnerable. And uh, they started attacking in mass from the front. And so they changed uh, the guns so you had a bombardier had a turret there with two guns in it. And the navigator had two cheap guns if he was available. So he had four guns in the I know the P-17 went by several stages. The last one was a G, which is what he Oh, yeah. Well, there were so many changes that resulted from combat experience or improvements, the factories couldn't keep up with them. So they had modification centers, and they send the aircraft from the factory to a modification center. United Airlines, for example, operated a center in Wyoming that specialized in these tail turns. Did he do any modifications in England? It was all in, in the U.S. Then. I don't know of any done in England. They may have done, but uh, I didn't have time to get any sort of weather sense. Icing was horrendous, and, uh, and, and frostbite injuries were rampant. And I've got a mission. Uh, pick up the you mentioned a uh, film about Clark Gable. Clark, this is Clark Gable, and he was just, he was going through before this squadron took off from England. They had 4,000 men in the field. They had 400 of the, of the crews and 3,600 the ground uh, support, and they were flying over from there to uh, to England. And uh, it was interesting that that was that, our group. It was your group. Yeah, yeah, he, said, yeah he said you're on it's your way, Joe. Combat America. Yeah. I don't think it's a very no, it, he, made, he, he looked great in his uniform, Clark Gable, man, no question about it, but just yeah. funny, it was... It, you know, it well, was, he had five missions while yeah. he was finishing yeah. 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 He was gone by the time I got there. Yeah. Yeah. It was just so but I picked up a lot of Clark Gable stories. I'm sure of that, yeah. <laughs> and Jimmy Stewart stories, they're the best. Yeah. Because yeah. Jimmy Stewart, <laughs> he was a good guy. He was a good pilot and a good leader. And uh, my first civilian boss was a retired uh, Air Force general who was uh, Jimmy Stewart's boss when Stewart went to wing. Wing is three groups. Right? And so he was full of Jimmy Stewart's stories. And they're marvelous stories. Uh, one I remember, this, this uh, Milton W. Arnold, he retired and was in Palm Beach, and I was touring with the Collins Palm, and we were at uh, uh, West Palm Beach, and uh, so I called Milt, uh, who was then retired, and I said, uh, he, he, uh, Jimmy Stewart and the general were, were B-24 men, and I said, no, we've got a B-24 out at the airport. Uh, one of them, have you picked up and come on out? He said, not interested. I saw too much of that airplane during the war. He wouldn't, he wouldn't even look at it. But we had lunch together, and uh, I said, uh, you know, once a year, Jimmy Stewart would come to Washington on reserve duty. And he finally made it. And... Uh, he would come to our office building, a little eight-story office building next to the Russian embassy. And you could tell when he came, because that was during the days of the uh, first electric typewriters that were so noisy. So noisy. Yeah, yeah. When the typewriters stopped, you knew Jimmy Stewart had arrived. And I said, I used to have lunch with him lunch a year, and I, I never met him. Uh, and uh, I've heard a lot of stories about him, and are they true? And he said, true, Jimmy Stewart never cut, even cussed. He said, I take it back. We were having uh, dinner outside the base of the hotel one night, and I said, uh, he said, ask Jimmy Stewart to tell him a Hollywood story. And Stewart said, well, you know how he wound up. Uh, he and... Um, I forgot the woman. I was going to say Claudette Colbert, a, 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 a brunette actress. Well, anyway, she was the wife. He was the husband. Had no children. They were supposed to inherit a little waif. And during the, the scene, this waif was to run in and hug her around the uh, knees. And when they shot it, Claudette Colbert, who I think it was, and she had on a long, slinky gown. And when this little kid came in and, and grabbed her around the knees, he got so 
excited he peed on her dress. <laughs> and reflexively, she threw him on the floor and said, you little son of a bitch. And he said, that's the only time I ever heard Jimmy Stewart swear <laughs> telling this story. And touring with Bob's uh, uh, aircraft, um, I, there was a, an old gent who used to help us up in the little airport north of uh, Minneapolis. Marvelous guy. But he was in the same wing of Jimmy Stewart, and uh, uh, the wing headquarters was at their base. And one morning he got to the briefing, this old chap got to the briefing uh, early, and they had a row of captain's chairs on the front row for any wing members of the wing who came. And then the group people were behind him, and he so he took a chair right behind the captain's table, and he fell asleep because uh, it was so early. And finally, they uh, assembled, everybody assembled, and the guy behind this chap uh, slapped him on the shoulder and said, they're starting. So he woke up and shot Stop the guy ahead of him on the shoulder and Jimmy Stewart turned around and said, young man, you got a terrific wallop. <laughs> but uh, every story I heard about Jimmy Stewart was good. They, they finally stopped him from flying after 20 missions because they figured the, uh, the Nazis, uh, if they ever shot him down, uh, great yeah. propaganda for them. Yeah. 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 Great propaganda. I want to thank you, sir. You betcha. You talked about it. Very good. Yeah. It's glad to meet you. Yeah. Yeah. I've never met a B-17 pilot before. You have oh. now. Oh, I have now. <laughs> well, I got a few stories. Fortunately, I came out whole, so I don't mind talking there about it. Some, some, some guys who didn't come out whole, yeah. they're a little hesitant. Yeah. 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 Thanks so much for coming. We really enjoyed hearing from you. Yeah. Thank you. It depends. Uh, probably uh, you could be in it ten minutes, you know, straight on. And I tell you, if uh, I wanted to fly, I could tell why the pilot, the, the pilot chief, uh, wanted to fly because he had to concentrate. Uh, if you were the pilot who wasn't flying, all you could do was sit there and watch all the. The flack and whatnot, and curl your toes. Uh, that, that would, you had to develop some technique, and mine was to curl my toes. Uh, but you weren't doing anything except watching the flack. And uh, when I would, when I was flying, uh, there were the Germans had lots of fighters, but they were shy on fuel and shy on experienced pilots. So if your group was a little nice tight formation. They wouldn't pick on them. But if they didn't, or if you had to fall out, and I've got a few stories on falling out, you're, you're live bait. How many missions did you actually fly? 33. Wow. Plus my satisfying one, which I never got to. But I'm flying a mercy mission. So by the time that you got there, there was, uh, we'd always heard it was 25. Initially it was 25, then it was increased to 30. By Jimmy Doolittle when he was head of the, and then 35. Unless you were flying lead, if you qualified for lead, it was 30. But I, I promised my crew, being 21 years old and full of myself, don't worry, guys, I'll get you all home. Well, you all, you didn't fly together all the time, particularly if you flew lead, because you're the various ones who were training with other people. So I kept, I kept flying until they were all finished. And then they kept me over. I was ready to head home, and the, my uh, operations officer said, uh, you're not going home, you're a combat instructor. <laughs> and I got a story about that. Uh, well, thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. you betcha. We'll see you next year. Okay. I'll be here tomorrow. <laughs> Would you be willing uh, to tell me? Would you be willing to tell me the story you didn't get to of your most successful mission? Uh, most satisfying. Or most satisfying. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, sure. Um, you don't mind me taping, right? No, go ahead. It's um, satisfaction is not a word you use much in combat. I mean, it, it doesn't seem appropriate to describe it as satisfying. But 
this mission was when the war had, had uh, uh, the day had occurred. And the whole Air Force, 8th Air Force groups flew mercy missions. Our, our wing, three fields, uh, was assigned to uh, fly French POWs out of a, a uh, old Luftwaffe base near Linz, Austria. And uh, we could, when we were brief, we were told you could fly any altitude, any route you wanted, singly, together, uh, just so you're at that Luftwaffe base at a certain time. Now, my navigator, uh, Ben Love, he became a big, big banker in Houston after. He said, Dick, how do you want to do it? And I said, uh, I want to go low level. I'll keep you out of the water. I'll avoid the flak towers, but take me right over that stadium at Nuremberg where Hitler addressed the mass troops. And that was a very popular picture. They showed it to us in training, even. Uh, but newsreels and whatnot. Well, Ben, we went low level, and it was a bright sunny day, so we could see well. And took me right over to that stadium, and Patton had been there through there about three days before that. And he, it was so it was full of equipment. And we littered it with trucks, tanks, but we literally dusted that off. <laughs> And we landed at the old Luftwaffe of base, uh, and we had a thousand airplanes on one run, or a hundred airplanes on one runway, waiting for the Frenchmen who weren't there. So we wandered around, and they told us, "Don't leave this base because there's so many DPs, displaced persons, traveling through here, and they're diseased. Uh, they're diseased. So stay on the base." And I remember. We were, I wandered over, we were, they had piles of helmets, daggers, and after we got sued, I wandered over to the side of the base that had a fence, there was a road, and across the road was a barbed wire fence, and there were a bunch of scarecrow-looking figures over there, and I remember one guy had found a pair of kind of shoe boots, and he was so thin uh, that he couldn't move. And I don't know whatever happened. He wasn't going to leave his boots. Uh, but I don't know what happened. Well, anyway, the Frenchmen arrived. They'd all been captured in the uh, Maginot Line, and they'd been prisoners for four and a half years, living on rumors. And they didn't believe it that morning when they were told that the guards disappeared. And they were told... Uh, uh, to pack their duffels, anything they wanted to take, because they were going to a airfield and be flown back to Paris. And they didn't believe it at first. But then they, uh, they finally, uh, well, they were all marching along. When they saw these hundred airplanes, they broke ranks. And that's what we saw. A cloud of dust was all French, but running. <laughs> So we had to reorganize it all. We all signed for, I think it was 30 some French people. And uh, uh, we took off. Uh, our mechanics had taken out the ball turrets, had boarded it over. They had organized barrels where the guys would place cigarettes and candy bars, uh, which were rationed in the base. And when the uh, Frenchman we took off, the cigarettes disappeared at the curb. Of but they wouldn't touch the candy bars. They'd been told, you know, four and a half years of starvation died. You, you eat something that's uh, like that, it's going to kill you. Mm -hmm. I don't know why they didn't take them again to the kids. But they, well, they wanted to talk to us. So I went back to the waste. Uh, and uh, there was one guy whose wife had been an international telephone operator who spoke good English. So I was chatting with him, and I said, why do you all want to talk to us? He said, well, uh, a lot of us learned to speak English in prison camp, but we were taught by a Frenchman. <laughs> and we didn't know whether an American would, would, uh, would understand. No, a Frenchman wouldn't understand my French. And another guy had made an escape map, just beautiful. I don't know how he managed it. And I tried to buy it, but he wouldn't sell it. And um, 
he kept track of our route. I was back in the waist, and then we had to go to the top. the nose is the favorite. But he knew when we crossed the river in the France. So there wasn't a dry eye in that airplane. <laughs> but we landed, old brick runway, about 30 miles south of Paris, and a French general finally showed up. And uh, okay. he, uh, we each took our manifest up. He signed it, kissed us on both cheeks. I got so flustered, I took off down and went home, got the louse with DDT. <laughs> In the days when we didn't know it was dangerous. That's right. That was before What's Her Name, who wrote the book. Rachel Carson. Rachel Carson, you know. No, that was that was the most satisfying, mm -hmm. which wasn't a true mission. Oh, I know. It's important. Well, but years in a lot later, of ways it was just as important. Thank you so much. Years later, this Ben Love became a big banker, and, and, and we finally got together after many years of visiting the Houston. This is another man. And he had raised a lot of money for charities, which bankers I guess do, uh, and then. They Buy and back scratch and all oh that. Oh my gosh. Uh, you're, and doing, you're doing better than most. Some of the money raises for a Jewish charity. And he must have raised it one. He raised enough money to build a wing on MD Anderson <laughs> Hospital. And he died of cancer of the appendix at that hospital, which is ironic. Anyway, he sent me a copy. Uh, he was one of three awardees. And he sent me a copy of the speech, acceptance speech that he made. In it, he told about this mercy mission. And he said, uh, we landed at an old Lothoff base right across the street from Mauthausen, which was an infamous yes. complex of six. Yes. Until that moment, I didn't know what I'd looked at for these scarecrow-looking figures. Mm -hmm. Now, this is some 20, 30 years after the war. We uh, we interviewed uh, several years ago a combat photographer with a fighter unit. Uh -huh. Started in England and worked their way into Germany. And uh, he was one of the first photographers at um, Dachau. Mm -hmm. And then to Dachau. He gave me copies of some of the photographs. And they are such that I've never even shown them to my wife. Hmm. They're that disturbing. Yeah. They are, you know, anyone, and there are those who try to say that the Holocaust never happened. Oh, they're mad. Once you see those photos, there's yeah. no doubt. There's no, there's doubt. no doubt whatsoever. <laughs> Not that I had any doubt anyway, yeah. but, you know, anyone who tries to say, nah, this was all Roosevelt's war. Not at all. Not at all. But the Mercy missions were satisfied. Mm -hmm. uh, combat is not satisfied. It's no. just an inappropriate word. It's a job. Yeah. It's a job. Get out there for the...